Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on the second day of this live broadcast coming from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, the Earth Tourism Network, EGN, a project of Internews and the Stanley Centre for Peace and Security have brought 22 journalists from developing countries to cover the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP26, as part of the Climate Change Media Partnership Programme. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference, which started in 2007. CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to report live from COP26, uh, which represents a pivotal moment in the global fight to combat climate change. Of course, with COVID-19 this year, um, travel has been very difficult, uh, more than ever for journalists to attend this conference. And because of this, we are presenting this live broadcast as a resource for journalists who can't be here um, to attend in person at COP uh, to still have the resources and the stories for them to do their coverage uh, remotely. Uh, from today until no uh, from yesterday until November 13, we will host the broadcast, uh, which is half an hour long, in which every day we will feature three speakers. The first of which will be a trainer from the CCMP program, followed by a fellow and an external speaker. And today's theme is green technology renewable, uh, green technology, renewable energy, and also innovation. So there's an increasing understanding on the topic of how the use of cleaner and more efficient energy technologies can reduce current costs and how this will allow for more techni technological options to exist. With climate change policies, there will be the adoption of new climate mitigation technologies to speak on their country's context on this topic and what kind of stories journalists are exploring on this. Uh, we will have our first speaker, Fermin Coop, the environmental reporter from Argentina to speak more on this. Hi, how are you? Welcome, uh, nice to be here. So Fermin, he is an environmental reporter from Argentina. He's a regional editor at Dialogo Chino mm -hmm. and is a COP trainer for the Climate Change Media Partnership Program. He holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and an MSc in environment and development. So for me, maybe we can start with, uh, you were part of the CCMP program uh, way back in 2014, covering your first COP. Um, so can you share about how the fellowship maybe has changed uh, the course of your career in environmental journalism, or maybe what it has maybe inspired you to do subsequent to your first COP? Definitely. Well, uh, being part of CCMP was a game-changing movement as part of my career. Back then, I was working at a, in a newspaper uh, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, uh, covering uh, economics, politics, and on the sidelines environment, which was a little tricky. My editors weren't really truly convinced on, on reporting on this. Uh, so I had to push the agenda forward quite significantly. And uh, one of the ways to do that was uh, applying for CCMP, uh, which I actually succeeded on, and uh, enabled me to go to Lima for my first COPA, uh, which is the one previous to the Paris Agreement. Uh, it was a really big deal for me. I mean, I got the chance to be in this big, massive event, which was really overwhelming on the first few days, as it as it is probably for many of the people that are attending COP for the first time. Uh, but uh, after actually being there, I started new programs, new projects. I engaged with new stakeholders and other reporters from around the globe. And it was a really big, big moment in my career. Thank you. So can you maybe uh, share with us what kind of stories do you publish um, you know, for your outlet and what kind of key headlines coming out of COP that you're paying attention to? Definitely. So uh, the outlet that I write for, uh, which I'm also the editor covering Argentina, Uruguay and Chile, focuses on the relationship between China and Latin America on environmental issues. Uh, so our readership mainly is based in Latin America, speaking different languages, but looking after issues related to the region. So the stories I'm pursuing here are mainly related to that. Uh, I already posted one as a sort of wrap up of the first week for uh, the region specifically. Now we are posting a second one today on land use since agriculture is a big topic for the region. Uh, we are gonna be also doing a few interviews 
interviews with some experts across the region that are here at COP as well. Um, and I imagine that this year we'll specifically be seeing at COP, uh, or actually we've already seen a lot of announcements from many governments uh, when the COP started. We'll probably see more of this in the coming days. Today and tomorrow we have the high level segment in which ministers will be speaking. Uh, so it's really a high level uh, COP with a lot of momentum, which I don't think I've seen in the last few ones. So it's definitely a big deal. I would just like to uh, let everyone know who's joining us that if you have any questions for Fermin, please uh, put them into the chat box and we will address them after he's done with our fine question. So um, in the context of Argentina, uh, what do you think is driving the government's decision to adopt favorable policies for renewable e energy? And maybe can you speak more about the energy transition in your countries? Um, as a journalist, what kind of stories are you pursuing beyond COP26 on this? Definitely. So I actually been reporting quite a while uh, on, on energy transition. I've done a fair number of stories recently. Uh, many of the countries in the region rely on fossil fuels for their energy matrix, uh, at least in Argentina's case, 75% of the energy of the fossil fuel metric is related to fossil fuels, mainly natural gas. Uh, so it's quite tricky to move ahead in, the, in that part of energy transition. There's still not that sufficient level of policies in place. Uh, we've seen a little bit of growth in solar and wind over the last few years, uh, but still we need more momentum towards that. Uh, I initially expected to see some of that as part of the green recovery efforts. Uh, uh, but sadly, it's, uh, it's been mainly business as usual across Latin America, uh, with a still of uh, many countries still investing in fossil fuels. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Fermin. Do we have any questions from the audience for Fermin? Okay. Uh, for now, we don't have any All right. No worries. On, in case Definitely. there are curious uh, people who will be joining us later. Definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker, we will have Isaac Anyogu who writes and edits stories on energy and environment for Business Day, a business daily based in Lagos, Nigeria. He's been a journalist for about five years. Uh, welcome to our broadcast, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, I understand that this is your first COP. So what are you hoping to get out of this, this conference? So essentially for me, it's an opportunity to understand the issues fully. So you hear of uh, adaptation, mitigation, climate change. I want to be in the room with the experts to kind of get a feel of uh, why these issues are important and how it can be reported in such a way that it makes an impact. So the COP has given me that opportunity. I've spoken to a lot of people, get a better grasp of the issues and the concerns and then see how these can be addressed as a journalist trying to report to inform the public. So can you tell us more about what kind of stories are you um, planning to write for Business Day? Um, you know, what kind of leads that you are following here at the conference? Okay, so Business Day is a business daily, uh, as you know, based in Nigeria. It's one of the biggest uh, business newspapers. So really, I'm focusing more on finance. So I want to understand issues around climate finance, especially adaptation. So a lot of countries are making pledges, net zero pledges, and also backing them up with uh, financial commitments. For my conversation with the African delegation, I seem to have the feeling that the negotiators may be walking back on some of the commitments made by your leaders. So the kind of interplay between those issues. So I want to understand what those issues are and what their concerns are really, and to report it better. So what kind of start uh, startups are actually driving re um, renewable energy locally in Nigeria, do you see there's a transfer of knowledge, um, you know, not just locally, but coming from outside as well? Sure. So renewable energy in Nigeria is actually big now. And that is drawn from the fact that the national grid uh, does not cover the whole country. So it covers just about 50% of the country. So you have a situation where there are regular power cuts. And you have a situation where these other startups are seeing opportunities. So you can either complain about the problem or you can find a solution. And these startups are finding the solutions. For example, you have uh, startups like Energy. Uh, they, 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 are, they have an innovative solution where in the city, they install solar solutions. Immediately you have a power cut, 
you just jump to solar and then you continue using all base there is also a company oxano they are trying to uh, assemble solar facilities in the country so they are trying to produce the solar panels assemble them and so a whole market is growing and the nigerian government is also supporting that sector heavily there are hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of uh, funds committed to support startups in that sector companies like uh, shell through their an investment firm they opened in nigeria called Olon. so far they have given about uh, 16 million dollars to startups in the nigerian ecosystems for different kinds of solar and uh, other renewable energy projects so it, it is thriving and it's growing in the country so so with that in mind uh, as you mentioned with the thriving um you know ecosystem right now for investments for renewable energy in nigeria as a journalist what kind of trends are you actually looking at or trying to investigate um based on this topic okay so i'm trying to look at what is the impact it's having because if you have energy to light up your room to read at night for children the next thing is how can you use that energy for productive uses? And that is what I'm trying to look at. So you are seeing some communities where mini grids are established and small business centers are taking off. It is empowering women in those communities to start up businesses. And I did a couple of stories a few uh, years ago. I went to a remote community that's uh, miles away from the capital. There is no electricity. And I was surprised by the kind of uh, industry that is growing in that community based on these solar projects. So I'm trying to investigate the impacts and writing stories around them. Uh, and what you mentioned as well is, uh, you know, what we understand is mainly the positive impacts, but you also have covered maybe the downside of this um, renewable energy or in innovation kind of industry on specifically the environmental impacts of some of these technologies such as batteries. Uh, can you elaborate more on, on that story? Sure. So in, in, 20, in 2019, 2018 to be precise, uh, I did an investigation along with a brilliant journalist from Germany. She came to Nigeria, we collaborated on the project. And the project was looking at, so these solar energies, you, you dispose of the batteries. And then there are plants that are recycling plants. For example, in Nigeria, in Lagos, there are a couple of them. They say they recycle lead ing ingots from the solar batteries but this is the problem so during the recycling process the wastewater the acidic water from the from the batteries are poured into drainages and they seep into the water sources where people drink from and that is a serious environmental threat you know so besides that the recycling process itself they emit gases into the atmosphere that are destructive to the health of people so we did that investigation, conducted blood tests on the residents and found high levels of lead in their bloodstream. So the, the investigation led to the German government and the European Union uh, deciding no longer to import lead ingots from Nigeria. It forced the government to set up new regulatory measures and actions to ensure that recycling is done well. So, why the renewable energy has several benefits. There are also downsides. And the downside can occur when you don't treat the waste the right way you should build. Because batteries are hazardous waste. And when you don't treat them well, you are, you are, you are inviting trouble, uh, as that investigation showed. Uh, thank you. I find it interesting that you know, your stories not only touch on renewable energy and innovation, but also the intersection of that industry with health and you know, other kind of um, you know, issues. That are quite relevant to our you know conversation on climate change which is not just limited to maybe something that's narrow but the impact is actually very very broad so um thank you so much isaac for your thank work you. as a journalist um we wish you luck with uh, you know your stories here at cop thank you thank you for having me our next speaker we will have uh, dr kelly sims gallagher who is a professor of energy and environmental policy at the fletcher school of law and diplomacy she directs the Climate Policy Lab and the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at Fletcher. From June 2014 to September 2015, she served in the Obama administration as a senior policy advisor in the White House of Science and Technology Policy. 
and she was uh, an, a senior China advisor in the Special Envoy for Climate Change Office at the United States Depart uh, State Department. She specializes in how policy spurs the development and deployment of cleaner and more efficient energy technologies domestically and internationally. So I think, um, you know, based on what Fermin and also Isaac has explained mm. about the national context and the local context, so I think now we will speak a bit more on the at the global level. So, um, so there's a lot of talk uh, at COP, you know, about governments from both mm. developed and developing countries, um, who are often criticized for not putting in place energy policies to phase out fossil fuels and incentivize renew uh, renewable energies fast enough. Several governments have made significant, uh, significant policy announcements at this COP so far. So do you observe um, a shift in energy policy making in recent years? And do you think that this, um, these shifts are enough? Well, we have seen a number of countries that have brought forward new policies as a result of the commitments they made in Paris in 2015. Um, and, and in particular, the European governments have actually passed climate change laws and are well on their way to reducing emissions. Um, but other countries have struggled to implement the commitments that they made. And as we're here at the COP, I think a very important question we need to be thinking about is what are the near term policies that governments are putting in place to get them on track for actually achieving the goals that they've set for themselves? And at this COP, we're actually, there's a lot of emphasis on setting new goals, more ambitious goals, but I still think that there's a gap between the goals that have already been set and the actual policies that have been implemented uh, so far. And that, that'll be something very important um, for us to be tracking going forward, because there's no possibility of meeting net zero commitments, for example, and one of the big announcements from the COP was India saying that it would uh, get to net zero by 2070. But there's no chance for India to get to net zero uh, by then or for the United States even to get to net zero by 2050 without real climate change legislation, policies, regulations uh, actually in place today. The, in other words, the long-term action depends on near-term policies. And um, so obviously there's been a lot of focus on, you know, China and the U.S., um, you know, who are the two biggest polluters mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, other countries focusing on, you know, what they're, they'll be doing. Um, what do you think about progress by other countries? You did mention India. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what should these countries, what kind of energy policies should they be pursuing? Um, so, so maybe like the smaller kind of emitters or maybe the, the moderate ones, yeah. Well, uh, you're right that China is now by far the largest emitter on a total aggregate basis, though it's not anywhere close to the largest emitter on a per capita basis. Um, and the United States now comes second. But there are many other countries um, that are have their emissions rising quite rapidly, like Indonesia and India. Um, and I think what we see is that these countries are waking up to the need to implement new policies. For example, in Indonesia, there's a new renewable energy law under consideration. And also Indonesia is considering a new carbon tax. Um, so I think the policies like these uh, will very much help these countries to begin uh, to think about how they're gonna reduce their emissions. But at the same time, I think it's very important for, for developing countries to be looking at adaptation and resilience policies because climate change is already here and countries need to be preparing um, for the impacts of climate change at the same time. So uh, for journalists who are covering the topic of climate change and energy transition, uh, what do you feel are you know, some of the topics that maybe are being underreported at the mm -hmm. moment? And how can they cover uh, certain concepts like just transition well, because it is quite loaded. So, mm -hmm. so where do they even start? Well, let me start first with this, this idea of a net zero track. Uh, this is a, a, a concept that political leaders are setting these very long-term targets. And the trap that, that we all might be falling into as observers is thinking that because this long-term target has been set, country will actually achieve that goal. Uh, so I think a very important story for journalists to follow is what are the near-term actions that the government has taken 
within the, the political leader's current term of office? What are they doing today to get the country on track? I think also as we, as we continue through this energy transition, um, governments need to be investing in energy innovation. They need to understand um, which energy technologies are suitable for their country and their unique national circumstances. And they need to, to really look hard at what that transition will look like from fossil fuels to cleaner sources of energy. And this term just transition is a very big term, but uh, really the, the issue is how do you ensure that there's fairness and um, social justice for all the workers who are currently employed in carbon intensive industries and making sure that there's a pathway for those workers um, and for the economy overall um, to shift to cleaner, cleaner sources of energy and lighter industries, lighter in the sense of less polluting industries, um, because that kind of compositional change will be very important for all economies as they search for that low carbon development model that's compatible uh, with a you know, 1.5 degree uh, world. Uh, you did mention about you know tracking government's policies and also um, you know how they implement it mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a longer or short term uh, short term goal. So do you have any tips for journalists on how they can actually um, do this tracking? Mm. How they can track this well? Because I think policies are a bit tricky mm. to to cover. So so what can you maybe advise journalists? Well, I think that the the thing that happened that the trickiest thing is to not just interpret a target as a policy. So if a government like India says, we will have 500 gigawatts of non-fossil energy by 2030, which is India's new target, um, <clears throat> then you need to see what are the actual policies that will help India achieve that target? Are they going to have a new feed-in tariff? Are they establishing a renewable portfolio standard? What are the actual policies that will create those incentives in the marketplace. And so we need to hold the governments to account that they actually put those incentive policies in place. They can use a, a carrot and stick approach. You know, what, one of the criticisms of the Biden administration's approach is that it's all carrots, right? They're trying to incentivize the marketplace with tax credits and loan guarantees and other sorts of fiscal tools, policy tools. Um, but, but most people believe that you need to have some regulations, performance standards, for example, saying, you know, the, the cars can only emit this amount of pollution, um, you know, per kilometer traveled, um, or power plants can only emit a certain amount of pollution. So you need to have this mix of different types of tools. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I think we will uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a few. Uh, the first one is, out of all the options for decarbonizing transport in developing countries, mm -hmm. which ones are the most efficient uh, and effective? Some sectors are pushing for zero emission vehicles and electric vehicles, but how does this compare to making public transport infrastructure that takes out cars altogether? It's a great question. I would say um, kind of leapfrogging to the clean and green public transportation is really the ideal because if people don't need to buy the car, you know, the individual personal vehicle in the first place, but they still have equal access to mobility, that's ideal. So really good, robust public transportation um, infrastructure would be, you know, my top priority. Uh, if people need to uh, purchase an individual vehicle, um, certainly uh, electrification is the future for individual uh, motor vehicles, whether it's two wheelers, three wheelers or, or four wheel cars. Um, and you know, one of the big challenges then is um, how do you move freight around in the transportation sector? And that's trickier, um, but many people now believe that hydrogen uh, produced with renewables uh, is likely to be the most effective uh, fuel for you know, clean fuel for heavy duty freight. And then of course, there's always railway uh, as a good mechanism for, for moving people across longer distances as well. Okay, um, our second question is um, Metro Manila 
It's a mega city notorious yeah. for traffic jams. Mm -hmm. How does this contribute to emissions and how can governments address this? Yes, uh, I don't remember the exact percentage of emissions from people just sitting in traffic, but imagine how frustrated everyone is getting, how much time is wasted and how much fuel is wasted uh, from traffic congestion. So again, moving to more effective public transportation systems that actually are so good, people are incentivized to leave their car at home or not buy the car in the first place. That's the ideal. I think uh, we have time for one more question. Um, what are underreported energy topics that you will suggest journalists to pursue? Um, so I, I think it, it goes back to um, some of the tips you mentioned earlier. So I think people just, uh, journalists especially, would just want to know where is a good place to start? Well, we have to move away. I mean, the, the bottom line is we have to be moving away from fossil fuels towards cleaner uh, forms of energy. Uh, and so I think the first question is, do the country, you know, wherever you're working, does that country's policy still support fossil fuels? Are there subsidies for the fossil fuel producers? If so, that is something to report on. You need to shine the spotlight on the fact that the governments are still supporting fossil fuels and therefore not supporting, you know, the cleaner, greener uh, technologies and approaches. I think also checking to see what is the government doing in terms of investments in energy innovation. Those sorts of investments are very important to launching the new industries of the future. Uh, and if the government doesn't have a plan yet for how it's going to transform its economy, uh, invest in the new technologies of the future, train the workforce, there's no hope for transforming the economy. So those would be two, two places I would start. Um, maybe just one last question. Um, what kind of um, topics within transfer of knowledge right now, uh, within this transfer of knowledge uh, between countries in terms of energy, do you feel that maybe journalists should look at, uh, look at more, more of? That's a good question. I think uh, one area that, that is very important is the trade of cleaner, energy technologies and the barriers to trade that are cropping up. For example, between the United States and China and between Europe and China, there are numerous trade barriers now on solar PV uh, where United States and Europe have put in tariffs on imports of solar PV. Well, that hurts consumers in the United States and Europe uh, who want to adopt solar PV. Uh, so I think one thing that's very important for developing countries is to try to make sure that there's free trade um, and, and no barriers to trade uh, in, in these cleaner energy technologies. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, we hope that more journalists will pursue stories on energy after this uh, with a clear direction uh, with your tips in mind. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So that's all for today's broadcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on day two. Uh, we hope that uh, the speakers today have enabled you to improve on your coverage for topics, especially on renewable and clean technology. And for tomorrow's theme, we will have climate change and health. So if you are interested in this topic, uh, please join us again at the same time. Our speakers will be Jody Gupta, Disha Shati, who are both fellow and tra uh, trainer at the uh, Climate Change Media Program here in Glasgow. And our external speaker will be Antonella Riso from Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And please visit the EGN website for more resources like this. And also to find out more about our fellows and trainers at COP26. Thank you and please stay safe.